I have a slightly complicated relationship with Diet Coke. But about a year ago, I started seeing headlines like these, not just one, but dozens, saying that Diet Coke might cause cancer, specifically the artificial sweetener called aspartame in Diet Coke. The World Health Organization now classifies aspartame as a possible carcinogen. I think people should be worried. Aspartame possible carcinogen. And more recently, I started noticing that seemingly normal everyday things could possibly cause cancer too. Top 10 things you do every day that cause cancer. Plants are trying to kill you. Night shift gives you cancer. Teflon causes cancer. At this point, it honestly feels like anything and everything gives you cancer. So that's the question I set about to answer. I dug into the science, the headlines and the fear economy to figure out what is happening, what is actually true, and why does it really seem like everything causes cancer? Cancer is one of those words that we all try to avoid, and for good reason. It elicits anxiety and fear in almost everyone. We all have been affected by cancer in some shape or form. It's the second leading cause of death in the US right after heart disease. But as well as being avoided, it's also a very misunderstood word. Most people think cancer is a single disease, but in reality, it's a bucket term for hundreds of different diseases, which all present and behave differently depending on where they start, what type of cells they affect, and even your individual DNA. But despite their differences, most cancers do share a core pattern a story that starts at the cellular level. Your body is made up of organs, organs are made up of tissues, and tissues are made up of highly specialized cells, each designed to carry out a very specific task. There are over 200 different types of cells in the human body, which vary dramatically. For example, myocytes in the heart pump blood, neurons in the brain transmit information, and skin cells protect you from the outside world. Throughout your lifetime, these cells divide billions of times for growth, repair, and maintenance. Normally, when cells get old or damaged, they're programmed to self-destruct, so healthy new cells can replace them. But cancer cells ignore these signals, and instead of dying, they keep on dividing uncontrollably, which is how a tumor forms. You can imagine a human cell like a car, and cancer is like a car crashing into a wall. There are a few things that might have happened and gone wrong that led to that car crashing. Firstly, the brakes may have failed, which means that the car couldn't have stopped. That's like a mutation in the tumor suppressor genes, which means that the cells can't stop dividing. Secondly, the gas pedal might have got stuck, which means the car just carried on accelerating. That's like a mutation in the proto-oncogene, which means cell division speeds up out of control. And thirdly, a mutation in the DNA repair gene is like your engine failing, but no warning light coming on until eventually something serious happens and your car crashes. Every cancer is caused by different mutations in different cells in different people. That's why there will never be a one size fits all cancer cure. Because of this, often the focus shifts to prevention. So lowering the chances of one of those three mutations ever happening in your body. So nothing goes wrong in your car and it doesn't end up crashing, hence you don't get cancer. Some mutations are inherited, but most, around 80%, are acquired over your lifetime. And up to half of these are actually preventable because they're caused by things that we can change. Anything that damages DNA and raises the risk of cancer-causing mutations is called a carcinogen. And you've probably heard of some of the big ones, like how tobacco smoke causes lung cancer or how UV rays from the sun causes skin cancer. Their links are very strongly established, but there are other exposures like the aspartame in my Diet Coke, which fall into the gray area because we're just not sure how strong the evidence actually is if they do cause cancer or not. There is a subgroup of the World Health Organization known as the IARC, which attempts to rank these substances based on how certain we are that they cause cancer. This group, the IARC, stands for the International Agency for Research on Cancer. I spoke with Dr. Andrew Love to better understand why the IARC's classification of carcinogens is problematic, because it turns out she's been very vocal of one major source of confusion. They're not actually doing research on cancer. Now, this might sound confusing that an agency called the International Agency for Research on Cancer isn't actually researching cancer. They don't conduct any primary research themselves. Instead, what they do is they review all of the existing studies that have been published by others, and then based on this, they classify substances based on how certain that they think something could cause cancer, based on the studies that have already been done. And so what ends up happening is that the monographs that they create are based on asking the question, is there any worlds in which a theoretical or hypothetical exposure to substance X, Y, or Z or activity X, Y, or Z could, in some world, with some person, increase the risk of cancer. And if you ask it that way, that answer is almost always going to be yes, right? Because there's always going to be some theoretical, you know, situation in which a person may have an increased risk of cancer. 
The best way I could think to explain this is that I love chocolate and if you handed me a bra of chocolate, I'd happily eat it. But now, if you had a gun to my head and force fed me an entire suitcase of chocolate, I'd probably feel very sick and then eventually throw up. It doesn't mean that chocolate makes me want to vomit, but yes, technically, in this very unrealistic scenario where you had a gun to my head and force fed me an unlimited amount of chocolate, I would throw up. That's kind of how the IARC's classifications work. They're not measuring a realistic risk, but instead they're measuring a hazard. And the two are very different things. So the analogy I use is uh, a shark attack. If you are standing on the beach and there's a shark in the water, a shark attack is a hazard because there's a shark in the water. But if you're standing on the beach, there's never any actual exposure to the shark. So your likelihood of getting attacked by a shark if you stand on the beach is zero. That's a hazard. Your risk starts once you get in the water and your risk is gonna change by what type of shark is there, how long you're swimming there, you know, how close you're to the shark, etc. right? And so that's the risk portion. So a hazard without a realistic exposure poses no risk to you. To date, the IARC has classified over a thousand different substances as a possible hazard, and some seemingly normal everyday things like aloe vera, iPhones, hot drinks, and the aspartame in my Diet Coke. Based on the certainty of a hazard, the IRC ranks those exposures into different groups. So group three, which means not carcinogenic to humans. Group 2B, meaning possibly carcinogenic to humans. Group 2A, meaning probably carcinogenic to humans. And group one, which means there's sufficient evidence to say it is carcinogenic to humans. Group one are the things where there is enough evidence to raise concerns, and you probably know about, so tobacco smoking, UV radiation, and drinking alcohol. But in a scientific context, the word possibly and probably, as in group two, is confusing because it doesn't mean what most people think it would mean. Possibly means there's actually no human evidence that these things are related to cancer, and probably means that there's really limited evidence and it's often, you know, observational only, there's no causal data, maybe it's in animals, and so it really confuses the public because then the media headlines are like, this is a probable carcinogen. And people think that carcinogen automatically means this thing causes cancer. So I guess the big question I'm trying to answer is, will this Diet Coke increase my risk of cancer? Well, from everything I've learned, cancer risk isn't just about what something is. It's about how much, how often, and in what context you're exposed to it. That's why we have regulators like the FDA or the EFSA, so Europe's Food and Safety Agency, to look at real life exposure, not just theoretical harm. And their job is to figure out what's the highest amount a person can actually safely consume every day for their entire life and still be fine. That threshold is called the acceptable daily intake or ADI. And for the aspartame in my Diet Coke, the WHO sets that number as 40 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So for a person like me weighing 70 kilograms, that's 2,800 milligrams of aspartame every single day, which is this many Diet Cokes. In total, 14 cans a day. And that's not even the amount that actually causes harm. That's just the upper safe limit with a buffer built in. You would probably experience issues of like over, you know, hydration, water intoxication before you would ever have issues with the amount of aspartame you would consume. Um, but of course, that nuance is lost when media headlines are saying, Diet Coke is possibly carcinogenic. So I guess this all means I'm fine to be drinking my Diet Coke whilst editing this video. Sorry, weird inception moment, I know. Back to Dr. Love's final message. It causes all this unnecessary fear when the vast majority of things that are on these lists, actually, there's not evidence that, you know, regulated exposures of anything on that list um, are really going to increase a person's risk of cancer. We need to hold powerful organizations like the WHO and the IARC accountable for how they communicate. Because in an age dominated by misinformation, every ambiguous headline or vague classification becomes a weapon for fear mongers to exploit. And instead of closing the science literacy gap, we're widening it. This isn't just about the aspartame in my Diet Coke. It's about trust, clarity, and responsibility. We need public health communication that prioritizes understanding over panic, that help people make better to inform decisions, not fear-based ones. This episode was heavily informed by the work of Dr. Andrea Love. I've linked her newsletter down below, so if you wanna go deeper, then please check her out, she's brilliant. And if you love this channel, you'll definitely love reading her newsletter. My name's Ash, a medical doctor, and I create these videos whilst I work full-time as a doctor. So if you wanna support me and the mission to create journalistically rigorous, evidence-based medical content, then please subscribe to the channel. You can watch my previous video I made on why allergies are on the rise globally. Until next time, and see you soon.